working as well as they were before. Um, but we're going to talk about culture, identity, and migration. So I'd love to hear from the audience. How many of you were? How many of you now live in cities? Living in cities. In the back, you can participate. And how many of you were uh, did not grow up or were not born in cities? Okay, fewer than I expected. Really, Quentin, we didn't know that about you. You seem very urban. Um, so that's one. Of, so that's just a micro example today, as we sit in Kiev, thinking about moving from the countryside to the city. That's what I did in my family. We started off rural and we moved to cities. And there was a slide that Peter Bishop had earlier that said, by 2050, 65% of the world is going to be living in cities. And with that comes lots of opportunities and dynamism, but there are also some challenges that happen to it too. And there are different ways of addressing these challenges. And um, I think what we have today is we have, here to my right, we've got Mariana de Bee. She is a vice mayor from the town of Breda. Has anyone been to the Netherlands? All right, excellent. And we saw a beautiful picture today of, uh, of Amsterdam. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the Breda story. And then to the far right is my colleague, Juliana Kerr, who is um, in charge of global cities at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And an interesting little fact I just learned over coffee. So as some of you may know, Chicago and Kiev are sister cities. And it's a very robust program of exchanges, cultural, business. Juliana will go into that. But it turns out that Marianne is here also because of a sister city relationship, because Rafal, from whom you'll hear later, who's from, excuse my pronunciation, Rocklaw. Said that okay? Wroclaw, Wroclaw, sorry. My, my Polish is worse than my Ukrainian so far. Um, is, is a sister city with Breda. So these partnerships already are working to solve, look at our challenges, our shared challenges, and our shared opportunities. So um, I'm going to kick it over now to Juliana, who will talk through our presentation, and then we're going to have a great discussion. easier to go through these slides and welcome everybody standing and then I'll sit back down. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Barbara. Thank you to everyone for having me here today. Um, I'm from Chicago. I work at an organization, a think tank, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and I oversee a global cities research agenda. Uh, through that, we look at a variety of different elements of cities as global actors solving global challenges. Uh, it's really a, it's a foreign policy organization. It's not an urban studies organization. So from our lens, we're looking at uh, kind of the rise of this non-state actor. It's a, not a typical uh, actor in foreign policy. And so we're, we're studying this lens um, in shaping political, social, and economic policies around the world. Um, I came here today with a very specific presentation to look at the cultural element of cities and then also a deep dive in the Chicago-Kiev uh, sister city relationship just to illustrate a little bit about the cultural conversation that we, we have at the council. Um, and I'll start here. Um, so the Chicago Council, as I, I briefly mentioned our research, I put this uh, picture right in the center there that's Neve moderating a panel just a couple weeks ago that we hosted in Chicago, a big conference on cities. And this was a panel about women leadership in cities. And I, I think we're gonna be touching a little bit about that as well. Oh, and I have a slide. I was worried about this. It changes by itself, so bear with me. Um, when we talk about cities, we talk about it in a, in a context of kind of four big pillars that are, oh, this is gonna be a real problem. Uh, that are essential to the, the fabric of a city, right? You have the economic element, we have the civic participation, the educational institutions, and the culture. And when we talk about it, I know um, Peter Bishop talked about culture earlier, and there's a lot of ways to categorize it or to, to quantify it, especially when you're doing an index of cities. Uh, you can count, you can count theaters, you can count music venues, you can count festivals, but there's also intangibles of culture. And that's really, I think, the, the nuance behind global cities that make them unique, that give them their identity. And there isn't a lot of ways to categorize that or to capture that, um, the essence of culture. In uh, Chicago, we, we did a report on Chicago as a global city and Chicago's global strategy. And in that, we also started looking at um, you know, the, the influence of blues 
UNESCO actually has an intangible heritage index that they give awards out to cities and to, to, to places, to concepts um, like rug making in Azerbaijan or uh, certain types of music like tango in Argentina. These are, these are things that make them so unique, but they also evolve over time. And so for us, when we're talking about the importance of culture in cities and that identity, I'm always looking at the cultural heritage component, but also what are we trying to preserve about that city and how are we using it to communicate around the world? Um, in Chicago, this is a, a picture in Chicago, we have this magnificent bean, it's actually called Cloud Gate, uh, that's in the center of Millennium Park. This is an iconic example of uh, a, a public space that defi defines Chicago, but also brings people together and, and has another nuance behind it as a place of integration and of gathering. We're looking at culture as cultural diplomacy, the soft power of culture, how it communicates across different societies. We're looking at how culture can change global mindsets and um, stereotypes and people, you know, how they see things differently. We also have a whole lot of research out there on culture and the economic benefits through tourism and, and I think that that's probably most of the time when you think of culture, you think of it through a tourism lens. But it really can also break down barriers and serve so many other purposes for a city. Uh, the World Bank actually released a report recently looking at culture as one of the critical ingredients for disaster recovery in cities. And if you invest in culture, then you can rebuild your city. Um, and it's the X factor is what they talk about. Um, so when we're thinking about cities, I wanted to zero in on Chicago and the cultural scene in Chicago. Um, there's a lot of different elements, right? That when you think of Chicago, architecture, the blues, um, music, uh, the history of the city, the urban planning. But I wanted to focus on Chicago's neighborhoods and largely in the definition around migration and the different people who have come through Chicago and changed it and made it evolve into the global multicultural city that it is today. Peter had a slide earlier today that I thought was perfect. It was the, what is a Londoner? A Londoner is somebody who lives in London. It was a map with a collage of different um, flags from around the world. And for, for me, when I think of Chicago, I also think of it as a collage of neighborhoods. We are known as a city of neighborhoods. Um, there's a map here on the, on the right that illustrates all these different wards of the city. And there's a Chinatown, there's a Greek town, there's a, a Mexican heritage village um, in Pilsen. There's an area that's largely influenced by Germanic, uh, German immigrants or uh, Swedish immigrants that have come to Chicago and shaped and helped evolve the city that it is today. I spend a lot of time working on migration policy and thinking of global movements. We have over 258 million migrants around the world right now. And cities are the destinations. They land in cities. Cities are the gateways. And so for the future of cities, and that's what we're talking about here today, our cities, our future, we do think of them, especially through a cultural lens, as cities of integration and cities of places where worlds meet and set new standards for being integrated societies. We've also had um, a, a variety of speakers come through Chicago and talk about the importance of this, the nuances, the things that make cities so, so special and so unique. And uh, I remember Wang Shi, you'll remember him when he spoke uh, several years ago, that you know, China wasn't retaining some of their, their iconic pieces that made Chinese cities. They were erasing and building all new construction and just creating, he said, monster cities. And we've heard of people creating soulless cities, cities with uniform buildings. Um, and I think for us, it's, you know, the challenge is really gonna be, how do you keep those unique identities and keep that alive? So since we're in Kiev, and this is my first time here, I wanted to do a, a quick little showcase of the many different immigrant populations that live in Chicago, um, but just do a deep dive on the Ukrainian one. And this is just one example, because we do have, I think, over 30 different nationalities with populations of over 30,000 people who call Chicago home. Our largest population is actually the Mexican population, but we have you know, a great uh, number of Indian immigrants, Chinese immigrants, and this is really a defining piece. 
Ukrainians are about 45,000 residents in Chicago. And what you'll see here are a series of slides of the impact that they've had over many, many decades of, of integration and arrival in Chicago and helping shape it into a multicultural city. There's a big Ukrainian National Museum right in the city. There's the new, relatively new, Institute of Modern Art. There are a lot of churches, a lot of Ukrainian churches in Chicago. And then there's all the food and the festivals, and they bring these elements of culture. I think this slide for me, when I was putting this together, to me what it represented, now I've only been here for about 24 hours, but I will say I don't think I've seen anyone who dresses this way. <laughs> Or, um, you know, the, uh, this is a, a preservation of a cultural heritage that's being showcased and communicated around in other parts of the world. This is a big celebration in our main square. Every year we have a Ukrainian festival for the Independence Day. But this is a representation of a heritage that, um, you know, who chooses? Who chooses what heritage and what cultural attribute that they want to showcase? Uh, these are all questions as we talk about the communication and the cultural diplomacy. And then the immigrant community in a city also shapes the culture and the political participation of a city. And this is just one example of a huge parade of protests that was organized um, by the Ukrainian community uh, when they were trying to advocate for participation of US government leaders um, in, in what to do with Russia. Um, this slide, I put it up here, and this is moving quickly, I'm sorry, I don't have control. Um, is our two mayors, mayor of Kiev, mayor of former mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, and they signed a sister city agreement. Well, they didn't, but previous mayors signed in 1991 a sister cities agreement to have strong linkages and exchanges between our cities. They've hosted Ukrainian students. They've had exchanges. I know um, Mayor Klitschko has a foundation here that has invited students from Chicago, young high school students, to participate in leadership summits. We've hosted the Kiev Orchestra in Chicago. We've had world music festivals. Violinists come from, from Ukraine to participate. Journalists and other political leaders come and give speeches. Documentary filmmakers. And this is all part of that soft power of cultural diplomacy and being in a city where these exchanges and this information is being shared. For us, the community is really um, part of the story of all the different communities that have shaped Chicago and made it the city that it is today. And I see this evidenced in other cities around the world, right? It's that evolution. It's a city that has its origins, but as other influencers, other factors come into play, as societies evolve, as migrant populations come, um, it shapes the culture of a city. So I took a minute uh, before coming to Kiev to Google Kiev, cultural capital, I inserted some keywords, and what I found was really interesting. Kiev doesn't usually rank in kind of the big global cities indexes uh, that you showed, the Mori Memorial Foundation one. We helped design a different one uh, that looks at, um, designed by A.T. Carney, that was looking at global cities. Uh, in, the, in 2008, we were also ranking cities. And Kiev was not necessarily in the top 10, top 20, top 30. But when you Google where Kiev is headed, there's all these, all this coverage. There's on Twitter and the Travel and Leisure magazine that it's on the horizon. It's on the cusp. It's a growing metropolis. It's a place where culture is vibrant and where the world is going to start coming and want to be a part and want to engage and experience whatever it is that's unique, that's very, um, something you can't find in other cities around the world. And so when we think of that cultural influence and what the heritage is that has shaped it today, I'm also mindful of how it's going to evolve in the future. People are going to come in, and we talk about this. As cities step out onto that global stage, they need to be prepared to invite the world that's going to help shape it and evolve it in the future. When, uh, when we were told we were going to be speaking with young leaders here today, uh, my, my call to you is to think about what is it that you want to preserve? Why you want to preserve that? What aspects of your culture is exciting? Uh, we met a young woman yesterday who was talking about how even in just the past 10 years, 
there are parts of the history that are, are not part of the public square anymore. And there's very deliberate reasons for that. But we need to always be mindful of you know, that evolution of culture and where we want the city to go. And also how to prioritize investing in the culture. What aspects of the culture you're investing, where is that funding coming from, and the citi citizen participation required. Because if you leave it just to government, then um, that will be one way. But the citizens are the ones who also help shape the city that they want. So with that, um, I will close. Uh, our, our message is that cities are, they are beacons and bastions of the cosmopolitan plural societies that we live in today. And um, largely through this, this global platform of, of urbanism, and this is where the world is being shaped. So thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Juliana. Svasiva. <laughs> And, and now you know why it took us so long to get to Kiev, because we feel like we have Kiev in Chicago. So <laughs> we're, we're glad to get the real thing. And now hand it over to Mariana, please, for her presentation on Breda. Yes, thank you very much. And Juliana, you said don't uh, let it go uh, only for the government. Well, I'm from the government, and uh, I take uh, really responsibility for culture. I'm an older man, vice mayor from Breda, uh, Holland. You already heard uh, Twin C uh, City uh, from Wroclaw, uh, no relation with Ukraine uh, till now because it is my first visit also to Kiev, uh, but uh, for now on I like it very much and hope to see something more. But uh, I want to tell you something about Breda and how I, as a vice mayor, uh, work on culture in uh, the global uh, city uh, uh, world. Because Breda is a small city. We are talking about big, big, big cities here, over here, Kiev, Chicago. Yeah, there are big cities. Breda is, is in that uh, way a small one. Netherlands is a small country. Uh, Breda is the ninth city of, uh, of the Netherlands, and we have just 168 inhabitants. Yeah, it's a small city. But on the other hand, it is a city, and it's still growing. Um, and it doesn't make it uh, less important to work on uh, the culture. Uh, for those who don't know where we uh, uh, are situated in Holland, we are in the south, and so we are a kind of international uh, city. We're in nearby Belgium, so we think that Europe is our, uh, uh, our ground. Uh, it's also an old city. Um, maybe you know uh, the king of uh, Holland, uh, although I'm uh, really a Republican, but we have our king, the Nassau, and they uh, started their uh, kingdom in Breda. Nice to know, I think. Um, Breda is a city of contemporary culture. Um, we have uh, the big names, DJ Tiesto and Hardwell. Maybe you know them better than the king or the Nassau. They're coming from Breda. We have really a DJ uh, tradition. Um, Breda is also a welcoming city. There's always something to do. We have festivals, big and small ones, but we are also a green city. We think uh, a good living environment is very important. And as I said, I'm responsible for culture. And we saw in the last year important developments in this area, and that's what I want to talk about today. Like every self-respecting city, Breda has a beautiful museum of historical and contemporary culture, the Breda Municipal, Municipal Museum. And we have a large theater, we have an art academy, a center of amateur art, and the harbor areas, cultural spawning grounds. Of course, every Dutch city has that. But Breda, Breda differs from the rest of the Netherlands in that its higher culture is often also found in the city's public spaces. The city itself is the stage, theater, and museum. Breda's residents are directly involved in culture. This thriving culture expresses it in dance performances and exhibitions, and even the city's walls are given over to artists. In that regard, autonomous quality of the work is paramount. We have found that the quality of the professional artist is a condition for a successful project. An important role of culture is to stimulate people's imagination and, and encourage them to see things differently, think differently, and try new things. Residents experience culture changing their living environment. They are proud of their living environment and are proud to be part of it. 
In this way, culture contrib contributes to their quality of life. In Breda, we want to touch the people with our culture. Now it's time to, uh, to show you a small film. I'm going to tell you more about these three projects, but, uh, but it's nice to tell. The last uh, uh, blind wall you saw uh, is from an artist that's now painting in Rochlov today. I read it in the newspaper. That's a part of our twinning. Um, but let's start with Dance Nest. It was the first uh, project you saw. Uh, it's a professional dance company that uh, dance on location, makes dance on location. That's what you saw in the movie. Uh, they use the city as social artistic work relates to contemporary times, how we experience our life environment and how we treat each other. That's what they are dancing for. Dance Nest makes daring connections between partners at the locations where they express their creativity. The performances promote interaction between people and their environment. Dance Nest is reasonably unique in this co concept. It only performs in public spaces. And, uh, uh, even just like uh, the mural, uh, they were three years ago, I think, uh, Raphael, in, uh, in, in Wroclaw also, when you were a European capital. And they danced with the Polish dancers on the uh, revolution, uh, how do you say, uh, a landmark in Rochlova, the, the very important 
a statue uh, for freedom in Wroclaw and they made a dance performance over there. And they had to react on uh, all the respects, but also possibilities uh, on that uh, stairs, monuments with Polish dancers that made a very uh, a, a common a, a, a performance what was from two cultures. It was our Breda dancers, but it was also something about the Rochlov dancers. Very uh, good to see what happened between those uh, professional artists. Dancers want to know how we live and how we treat each other. A bond is created with the residents during the rehearsals and the performances. Cooperation is often intensive and residents acquire a new view in the world of which they are part of. An energy is generated and a positive experience results. Well, then, the second part of the movie was about Breda Photo. You saw a lot of uh, pictures of a very big exhibition in the center of the city. The huge pictures, and you saw our beautiful church uh, behind, uh, and Breda Photo is the most is one of the most biggest photo festivals in Europe since 16 years. Last year we had the eighth edition. It is a Biennale, and uh, the title of the uh, exhibition was To Infinity and Beyond. Um, Breda Fo Photo is the first cultural institute in Breda to adopt the point of departure that culture is for all the city uh, residents. This was achieved by the festival developing a method with, by which large parts of the exhibition were exhibited in all kinds of public places around the city. The art could be visited by everyone and it was held on a large scale so it had a substantial impact to the environment. Photos could be seen displayed under bridges as city beaches and in massive general deserted city parks. These areas are generally transformed into li live lively meeting places during Breda Photo. Breda Photo takes six weeks, so it's really a period uh, in time. Uh, it's also, of course, a magnet for national and international visitors. More than 85,000 people visited the exhibition du during these six weeks. And of course, there are private locations where you have to pay some fee uh, but most of it is in public spaces. And the Breda residents are very proud of this exhibition. They, they, it's on places where they um, uh, accept the visitors, but they take care for the artwork. There is none violation against the artwork. Although it's open, it's free, there is no, uh, nobody uh, harms the photos because of the, uh, the, the people who live there take care for that and they adopted the photos. They are proud of what they have in their neighborhood and that they are a museum for six weeks. Their street, is their, uh, their place is a museum and they take care for that. One of the most important parts of those, this festival. Um, it has also taken current social context, of course, and it is not only showing the nice, uh, the most beautiful pictures or uh, getting the most important photographers to the city. No, they're working together with the students who are on the academy. They have uh, six uh, relations with other art academies in uh, Europe. All those students are coming and having their program, so there is a lot of exchange around this program. Uh, so also the young uh, students uh, of Breda are really involved in this program. Uh, and we are very proud of it, I can say you that. Then at, the, at last, the Blind Walls, I already mentioned it. it that, that project started um, with a problem that I think every city has. There is a lot of uh, dirty graphic uh, uh, on, on murals. It, it doesn't look good and the municipality has to clean it because we don't like it. And uh, the, the, the people from Blind Gold Wall Gallery said, well, maybe if we make nice murals, good murals, with uh, uh, professional artists, then we can make this neighborhood much more uh, agree, uh, how do you say, uh, that you like it, that agreeable. you agreeable? Yeah, sorry, I was looking for the word. I'm sorry, English is not my language. Um, and 
although everybody and also the municipality was a little bit, oh gee, is this what we want? What do, are we going to get in the city? They saw it was a success. What you see is that when uh, there is a nice mural on the wall, the other ones, the ones who want to make their own tag, respect that and don't write or uh, make any paintings on that wall anymore. So it gets a, l a lot more cleaner in, uh, in our city. The second part of our murals is because, of course, eh, in a lot of cities you see the murals, but we have taken a sp uh, specific uh, subject for it. We are telling stories, stories from our history on our murals. So this isn't just a nice uh, spot you saw uh, in the movie, a spot where it's, uh, the story is told about the brother of Vincent van Gogh. Everybody knows Vincent van Gogh. And he, uh, his father lived in, uh, in Breda and he was born just nearby. But he also had another brother who was not so well known, but he worked in the machine fab fabrics in uh, Breda. So one of the murals is the story of the brother of, uh, of Vincent van Gogh. But there are 80 stories in the city now. And now we changed uh, our uh, heritage uh, program at schools in visiting the murals from the Blind Wall Gallery. Because we thought, we, we, we mentioned that the students just, they, they get energy from having the story told in another way. The murals, they are surrounded with in the city are for them very um, um, good to, to learn the history, to learn the stories and uh, tell them further on so they stay in our city. They are really combined with it. So I think that's a very good and successful uh, project that we are making bigger and bigger in uh, Breda and uh, also bringing to Europe. Okay, let's start with our guests. Thanks very much, Mariana. So um, we've heard two great stories here today, uh, but I want to hearken back to the title of our panel, which is Melting Pot or Conflict Zone. So it's, it's, it's striking, actually, because Juliana talked with great pride about our neighborhoods in Chicago, our villages, for lack of a better word, where different cultures can come. And then Mariana talked about large projects. But then there's a place in between that I think goes back to our first discussion this morning about civic participation. And you can't, in my view, truly be a civic participant if you move to Chicago and you just live in a Mexican neighborhood and you only speak Spanish and you only eat Mexican food. Um, but also if you maybe don't understand because you're just participating in high art and dancing in public places. There's a place where the rubber hits the road, where we need to talk about social cohesion or multiple identities. Um, so Juliana, because I know you've done some work on Latin America and violence because if we think about some of the discussion we had today r around populism, uh, some people would blame some of that on migration. Not everybody believes that, but for some people, you know, foreigners coming in, migrants coming in, it disrupts a balance one may have in their culture. Uh, how, how have you seen that addressed well? And can you talk to us a little bit about this in, in Latin America? Because I know you did that World Bank project or somewhere else, because this is where it's happening. Not the neighborhoods, not the, not the dance studio. Um, yes, there's, there's a lot to unpack in that question because a lot of the, the conflict zones that we see, and it's, it's a cultural divide really in some of these Latin American cities and in Chicago. I mean, Chicago is definitely making headlines for years, if anybody's been reading, of the high levels of violence and uh, intense segregation that is historic in our city. Um, that's not necessarily a result of migration. Uh, I think that in European cities, we, when I think of Paris, for example, there might be a different story. Um, but in Chicago, there is a cultural tension uh, that occurs but it, from a lot of you know, bad policies and um, urban planning decisions and we, you know, that integration that's been happening for years. When I think of um, Brazil, you know, the violence stems again from that segregation and that divide uh, that it has been a part of the, the history of these cities and the evolution of the city. Um, so when, I, when I'm trying to answer the question, I'm thinking of both the, the violence and the conflict zone and then separating it out from the migration perspective and the integration. Um, in, in both cases, though, the community participation is key and bringing the two-way street. That's where you get uh, the community stepping up with what they want and the governance structures offering a platform 
to figure out where they can meet in the middle. I feel like all politics is about compromising somewhere where everybody wins a piece of what they're looking for. Um, but I can go into to more examples of the, the community effort for outreach, if you'd like. Well, maybe uh, I have a nice small example. Uh, I mentioned uh, the last picture of uh, Ram Ramon Deckers, and uh, I suppose you don't know who Ramon Deckers is, but in Breda we have uh, a, a, a neighborhood uh, with low social economical uh, uh, the inhabitants and there is a lot of populism there isn't much trust in government ev uh, over there but they have a hero Ramon Deckers he was a very big uh, kickbox fighter very very famous in uh, Thailand uh, and although there were some uh, things we yeah, well we think is everything okay the neighborhood is very very proud of him and by making a mural of, for him uh, in his neighborhood, we connected the people to the government any, uh, again. So that makes, uh, I don't say we uh, lose uh, uh, the war against populism with making murals, of course not. So uh, as it was that simple, then we uh, do uh, nothing else uh, than that. But it helps uh, him the, this neighborhood to get some uh, trust in the government by making uh, this kind of picture and earning this, uh, this person. Getting the respect that the picture brought. And it struck me too, one thing in Peter's presentation this morning, when um, thinking about work, the way we work in the 21st century uh, is so different than how we worked before. That was at least a common meeting place for people from different cultures where they might work together in a shop or in a, f a factory or in a, some kind of firm, and now people work remotely, and so there's less integration that way. But uh, then again, we have these beautiful public spaces like in King's Cross or in uh, Millennium Park where it's small d democratic people getting together. Um, are there other ways that you've seen for how to kind of organically bring people together from different cultures that are more, more migration now than we talk about in Chicago because that's more historical migration than than contemporary. Yeah, well, uh, Chicago and, and a lot of cities across the United States are being very proactive about integrating uh, the migrant communities and foreign-born communities into the, the economic vitality of cities, uh, socially, politically. Um, there's an entire program, actually, called Welcoming America that sets standards, and cities have been signing on uh, to these standards of inclusion. Um, offering microfinance loans to small business entrepreneurs to help revitalize different districts so that they're not just investing in their own communities and their own neighborhoods, but that they're also helping build out uh, employment opportunities and small businesses across the city. Um, these types of standards also offer uh, language courses and civic participation courses. What does it mean to kind of opportunities for engagement in the political life of a city? Um, there's also in education with children and in schools uh, programs for learning English as your uh, as your language. Second, I don't want to say second language. There's actually new terminology now that most migrants uh, are coming with third, fourth, fifth languages. So it's not necessarily their second language anymore. Um, but how to get integrated through through language and through other um, aspects in the schools. Uh, so there's a lot of that cross-pillar, cross-pollination, and how communities can be a part of the fabric of the city, and how the city itself, the residents who've been there, who might have um, been born, you know, generations of Chicago, um, are now also evolving. So we think of bilingual school districts, for example, where the American kids are learning Spanish, and the Spanish kids are learning English, and everyone is bilingual together. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for that. So, uh, um, Mariana, I'm curious, from your perspective, you can't have a conference on cities without mentioning Singapore. It's essential because that's hailed as, you know, the great city that works. But, and as many of you may know, it's a very multicultural city-state. Uh, there's a lot of subsidized government housing, and within the housing, they have certain ratios they have of whether it's Tamil, Malay, Chinese, European people uh, who have to live there. So if you're a Tamil family and you move out, uh, and a Tamil family has to move in to keep the integration. It's striking when you're there. Um, but, you know, there's a cost to that. There's a cost to the government 
deciding these things instead of having the market decided. Do you have specific policies that you have used in Breda to kind of force integration more? Um, uh, as I said, Breda is a, uh, a lot more smaller. Uh, yeah, of course we have uh, activities where we uh, stimulate uh, integration and we are looking to ways uh, to that people uh, connect to each other and as I said, uh, we think public space is a very good surrounding, better than putting uh, people in uh, only in a classroom. Of course, children are meeting each other in a classroom and there's a lot of integration in schools, but for the, uh, the adults or uh, just the families have the integration, uh, you, the public space is more, much more convenient. Um, I was uh, thinking about uh, something uh, you are telling. Um, we have a very good uh, another uh, choreographer, how you say, dancer, um, who is coming from the suburbs in Brazil, and now he's working in Breda. And he saw that the Moroccan boys, who are always on the streets, and there are a lot of people who think, well, gee, when uh, they, you know, are they doing okay in Breda, and are they part of Breda? Uh, they are playing football. And he saw them playing football and thought, well, maybe the moves they make, they like, they are a little bit similar as uh, dancing. So he learned them dance, to dance. And now they are having a performance in the theater, although th these boys, only w the only thing they wanted to do was playing football. And I think that's a way of integration where the two worlds are coming together. Yeah, it's not forced, but it's a way. Well, we, we'd love to uh, also, I forgot to say earlier, congratulations to everyone on your new diplomas. Well done. That's hard work and um, trophy. We'd love to get you involved in the conversation. Um, yes, we'll take a question right here. Here, I'll, I'll come over to you. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentations. My name is Anastasia Pochumban. And I, I have a question uh, related to integration. And I was wondering whether, like, a way to create more integration is also gentrification, but do, do you think that's the only way to integrate and does, does it in your view lead to more inequality and how to avoid inequality in the gentrification process? Thank you. Thanks, that, that's a great question I think because hipsters, I don't know if you have the Ukrainian um, version of hipsters? Yeah, oh okay, everyone's nodding. They, they've been blamed for a lot of the negative side of gentrification. You know, Brooklyn used to be a place where lots of people could live, then the hipsters came, and now nobody can afford to live there anymore. Um, Juliana, do you have anything on that topic? Yeah, we, um, we've certainly, I think that that's probably the big grand challenge for our cities, and it's not just Brooklyn, right? It's, it's every artistic community that has that unique quality uh, that whether it's through the graffiti art or the music halls or the bars or something at the aesthetic of that the, that location that makes it unique and attractive and so everybody comes out and they want to be a part of it and then the pricing skyrockets for for housing no one can afford to live there and now even the artists who made it fabulous are pushed out and and now it's being owned by a bunch of um, people who rent out their apartments to Airbnb and no one lives there and the community has now fallen apart. So that story of gentrification is a huge challenge. Uh, what I've seen is some cities who've come up with policies to grandfather and lock in through rent controls or pricing of the neighborhoods so that they can ensure that the people who made it a vibrant location will stay vibrant and not get pushed out through the pricing. Um, those are those are challenging. I think from a, a political side, they can be challenging to to navigate. But every city that has that vibrant, it, it's the story that you see all around the world of those vibrant artistic communities that are um, no longer able to afford the studios that that made it great. Okay, we have another question over here from our next panelist. Changing the subject slightly. I wanted to ask you to address a few sentences the subject gender imbalance, but not only women in a leading position, but generally gender balance. Do you, because it does belong to the culture in a wider, wider meaning as well. Do you think it's really crucial for our development, as I, as I do think? All right, we like having male feminists in the audience. Uh, yeah. um, I think uh, a lot of... Um, um, Gee, where, where shall I start with the answer? Um, 
when I talk about uh, culture in, uh, in, in, in the public space, that, that's where I started, uh, then um, you, um, you make it possible uh, that everybody uh, joins, that everybody is part of it, not only um, the, 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 the hybrid uh, culture. And uh, women uh, are part of uh, communities and uh, families are uh, in the streets uh, more often uh, so uh, for them it is in important, especially also for the, the more traditional uh, immigrants uh, also in Breda. Uh, having uh, an eye for, uh, for the, the, the social uh, connections in the city, I think uh, 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 female uh, leaders have more eye for that, uh, for I, I think. Um, my, uh, the, the male uh, leaders in the city, are more uh, on economic uh, uh, subjects, and uh, I think that the relations are more uh, our first um, uh, suspect. So uh, I think it's important that we have uh, female leaders in, in the city. Uh, I'm very happy that it's really equal uh, organized in Breda, and it makes us a bit of better city to live in. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if 50% of your population is um, female, then of course I think you know a, a good democracy will have that voice. What I what I found really striking earlier, and this is this is one of those intangible cultural elements that are hard to shape in a society. Um, it takes sometimes years, generations to shift the the mindset that that global mindset, that cultural values. But earlier today, Katya mentioned something about the cultural code in Ukraine versus in Russia versus in um, the United States when they were talking about democracy and the cultural norms, the cultural behaviors. And when I think about women in politics and women in leadership roles, I feel like that is a shift that we've seen dramatically, um, not just you know, in a fight for rights over the last um, you know, several decades, but even just recently, we, we organized, Neve and I have worked on a number of conferences. Eeks! <laughs> Um, I thought that was going to be a much more dramatic collapse. <laughs> uh, but we used to organize conferences where it was completely acceptable to have a panel of all men sitting there and sharing their ideas for the future of, of civilizations and politics and governance. And now, here we are 10 years later, it's completely unacceptable to have a, a panel of only men. So it's, um, those are the cultural nuances that I think are shifting in our society. And you don't always know where it's going to go. Um, they're hard to predict. But I, I think that they do lead towards a more inclusive world. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and I'm really glad that, that you asked that question, Rafa, because you know sometimes people think on this issue. We recently hosted the Swedish ambassador to the United States uh, on a platform. And then as many of you know, we're all supposed to look up to the Scandinavians for their female participation in parliament and in business and on boards of companies. They have 40% mandatory um, board inclusion. Uh, but on the municipal level, they're not actually doing that well. They're not faring well at all, surprisingly. But sometimes when people hear one of the, one of the, um, excuse me, one of the keystones to their um, current uh, foreign policies, they want to have a feminist foreign policy. It's not at the, to the exclusion of men, it's the opposite. It's that the men are forced to include the women. So they're at the table because we have a saying, if you're not at the table, you might be on the menu. So we need to make sure that that's, uh, that's not what's happening. I see an arm in the back. Is there another question back there or somebody stretching? It is the longest day of the year today. So there's plenty more of your day ahead. <laughs> uh, do we have, we have time for one more question, I think, Quentin. Is that right? Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> 